Welcome to the uh, IRDR Careers and Opportunities Fair. Um, this is our 10th annual um, Careers Fair. Uh, this event was uh, first launched to give our postgraduate students um, a chance to meet employers in the sector and find out about career paths and um, opportunities in risk and disaster reduction. Um, we also targeted it for other UCL students, members of the IRDR or prospective students who might be interested in opportunities in this area and interested in how our postgraduate study programmes might help them to access these, these opportunities. Um, so anyway, today, without further ado, I'm going to move on um, to, well, first to say for today, we'll, we'll go through, we'll have um, several talks. I'll introduce each speaker just before they talk. Um, if you have any questions, try to note them down and remember them because we'll do all of the Q&A at the end for all of the speakers. So any question you have, just note it, remember it, and I'll go back to you all for questions at the end. So um, first thing we'll start, our first speaker is David Munro, who's from the Civil Contingency Secretariat of the Cabinet Office, has a background in Earth Sciences from Durham University, and after a couple of years working as an environmental engineer, he was emergency planner for the City of Edinburgh Council and later the London Fire Brigade, and moved to the CCS in 2018, where he now works with the readiness and response team. Hi, Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Rose, and I'm joined by some of my colleagues here. I've seen uh, Kirsty and uh, Will up there, and a few friends around as well. So. Um, I've not been here for a few years, and I think we've probably been here for a few years either because uh, of the pandemic. Um, Thankfully, we seem to come in and end up, but that's been our lives pretty much for the last two years in CCS as well. We have a part of government that looks after uh, emergencies and crises as they happen and helps help government work through them. And uh, that probably means you're going to throw quite a bit of shade at me um, for the sort of measures you've had to you've had to endure over the last few years. Uh, so, on behalf of, of us, we apologise for anything that's causing inconvenience. Um, but hopefully, we're on the way up. Um, so, so I thought I'd just explain what CCS is. So CCS is the uh, Civil Contingency Secretariat. There'll be loads of acronyms in here, so I'll try and uh, refrain from using too many. But it's part of what's called the Cabinet Office. So the Cabinet Office sits around the Prime Minister in the simplest terms and helps government work together. So as the government department, there's loads of different departments all focusing on loads of different things. You have to farm the transport, looking after transport, farm health, looking after well, pandemic, effectively. Um, and, uh, and often they don't like to work with each other. So um, the Cabinet Office has, uh, has existed to make sure they do work together and they work together collectively to come out with the best outcomes. And we help draw that together when it comes to emergencies um, uh, and also uh, making sure we come to the best outcomes. And that's the most important thing when it comes to emergencies that we are working to protect life, you know, protect the UK's interests both at home uh, and abroad and protect prosperity. Three pillars of our of our strategy. And we sit under a figurehead called the National Security Plan. So uh, Mr. Stephen Lovegrove is that fellow. Uh, he's been in post for about a year now. Um, uh, and his, his role is to coordinate that and to give advice straight into the Prime Minister on anything that's emerging, anything that's happened when it comes to an emergency of a risk. And so we're sort of split into sort of four thematic areas down the bottom here. So we're over on the left. So we deal with civil emergencies, as they're called. So basically everything that's naturally occurring or accidental, if you call it. National Security Unit looks after you know, more sort of um, intentional risks, so like terrorism, 
uh, uh, sort of state threats, uh, cyber activity, all that sort of stuff. International Affairs uh, looks after what's going on around the world. They're obviously doing a lot quite uh, at the moment with Ukraine and Russia. And then you've got International Economics Unit that looks after the security of that, looks after that prosperity strand to be honest with you. Um, uh, and they're also uh, involved in things like sanctions, etc. Um, we are all separate. But uh, as we should do, we all work together when it comes to times of crisis because quite often, for example, if you'd have a, a counterterrorism incident, that would have ramifications of a civil nature. So, for instance, it could be shutting down streets, it could be uh, permanently shutting down key parts of our infrastructure, the bomb would go off, for example. Uh, uh, and if you look at things like Ukraine and Russia at the moment, obviously, international affairs looking after that, there's a, a big state threats aspect to it. There's also civil impacts that may emerge from things like increased fuel prices or, uh, or gas prices, etc., uh, which, uh, which could result in civil impacts. So we all work together, uh, and we also we also make sure that government works together. We're focused around sort of four pillars and what's called the emergency management cycle, uh, and explain actually why we're set up the way we are quite nicely. Um, if you haven't come across this concept before, uh, this is pretty much uh, how all sort of responders so. You, the emergency responders uh, in the UK uh, sort of set themselves up and we go through these processes uh, based on our team. So um, we, we are effectively there to help government coordinate itself, um, but also to provide advice, draw in advice from development partners, uh, and also set up crisis uh, response structures if we need them. It's the famed COBRA without an A, um, despite every single journalist under the sun. It sounds better, it sounds like a snake. Um, so, the parts of CCS that you could potentially work in if you want to come work with us. And actually, Kirsty was sat here uh, a couple of years ago doing this exact master's program and now works with us in CCS. So, there is a pathway into the organization which you can follow, um, which is really useful and hopefully aspirational for you guys. Um, so, the part, part of organization uh, fits on Critical sectors. This is sort of under our prevention and preparedness strands of that national cycle. These guys are looking after that key infrastructure that really supports the UK as a country. There's obvious things in there like power stations and motorways and banks, um, but there's also sort of things in there you would never notice when you wander around the streets. Things like key junction points for your railway lines. If they were knocked out, we'd lose whole swathes of our railway infrastructure. Key water treatment plants that you can. So safely drink water, uh, and, and also some of our defence sites. So where we develop key sort of technologies in defence and space, etc. And also medicines, uh, put them down over in Salisbury, uh, is where we develop a lot of our sort of, uh, sort of key uh, key sort of chemical weapons and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of sites in there, um, and a lot of um, a lot of infrastructure that the guys in CCS work with. To make them more resilient so that they are less likely to fall down and cause consequences. Uh, Parliament's in there the bottom, actually. Parliament is not a critical national infrastructure, which you can draw conclusions from that as you will. We can live without politicians uh, and what glorious world that would be. Um, okay, the next, the next team that looks after TCS is, is called the National Risk Assessment Team, or National Security Risk Assessment Team. Um, and uh, this is uh, the basis, the foundation of all the work that we kind of do in CCS, but also across government and down to the local area when it comes to responders. It's about setting out what are the risks that could impact the UK. What is it that we need to worry about? What is it that we need to plan against? What is it that we need to develop contingency measures to deal with? Now, there's a smattering on there of examples. We obviously score them uh, in a very complicated process, which is actually going on at the moment for the latest review. Uh, and we effectively prioritise where we need to work. You know, if something's down in the green area, we can you know keep that sort of trucking along. But if something's up in the red area, pandemic's on there, we need to do a lot of work to make sure we're prepared as a nation um, to, to, to be able to respond to those. So this team works together to produce this product called the National Risk uh, National Security Risk Assessment, uh, which is what we base everything on. Um, once we have that, we have an understanding of what the risks might be and how they materialise. We need to develop capabilities to be able to deal with those risks uh, and the capabilities team is there to do that so we effectively work with local responders to develop capabilities against the risks that have been stored in the risk assessment process a basic form of capability is something like a fire engine but it can go up to something really complicated like a pandemic response plan 
So there's a massive scale of differences to all these different capabilities. Uh, but there's a team that makes sure that they're being developed properly, and the people that look after them and are responsible for them are doing it in the right way. There's a training doctrine standards team. So they look after how we train our civil servants to deal with this. Um, obviously, you can go off and do academic courses, etc. But once you leave that sphere, how do you keep yourself continually developing and continually up to date the latest processes? Uh, and it's this team who work at a very, very sexy building up in Yorkshire, uh, which is actually an old spy training college. Um, uh, and they, they sort of deliver training from there, as well as virtually, of course, um, to civil servants, emergency responders, and everyone across the realm. And then we sort of go into final sort of preparedness space. So I'm working with communities and making sure the communities are resilient uh, as they can be, making sure they are prepared. This usually comes out in the form of sort of communications for people that are in the way of risks. For example, if you're near living in a flood zone, etc., uh, you may be targeted by communications that say you're at risk, you need to watch by your surroundings. What can you do as an individual to improve your resilience against these risks? Not just relying on organizations like the government or local authorities to do that for you. This is a team of Ivan. So, what happens when all was wrong? Um, we need a capability to be able to draw government together, to be able to respond in a way uh, that it can deal with an emergency in the best way possible. We obviously use horizon scan, so we track a couple months in advance what we might be worried about. Uh, things that are sort of slow rising tides uh, are a little bit easy to prepare for, but often it's those splash, uh, you know, quick splash emergencies, like a bomb going off or like a large storm that we need to prepare for in very little time. And it's a team that I work in and that Will works in uh, that helps does that. And if it all was wrong, we need to set up a strong structure. We have a COVID team itself that looks after the actual physical facility. So it's not as sexy as it looks on the TV, fortunately. There's not sort of iPads that you can fling stuff onto the walls, the little sexy, we don't have laser pointers to one city. Uh, but it's a secure facility with secure com uh, communications that we can contact anywhere in the world to any of our posts around the world. Um, uh, and we also have backup facilities around the country should Whitehall be knocked out for any reason. Uh, and it's this team that helps maintain that. So if you're into your sort of tech, uh, resilient telecommunications uh, and looking after a crisis center, it's these guys that do that. We've had a recent capability developed actually, which Frey is from. It's a natural situation center. Um, this is this is a bit money pumped into actually. It's the legacy of Dominic Cummings. Don't all don't all sort of scrunch up and and frame with that. And it's a it's a, a capability that is involving analysts working very much on data around risks, which obviously we've done in the past. But it's trying to create a culture within government of collecting the right sort of data so that we can spot crisis maybe earlier than we ever have been able to before, but also provide useful products for briefings. Uh, and we're giving to ministers, et cetera, when something does go wrong. And they're based in the National Situation Centre. And you see, you've got here as our minister in the Cabinet Office, uh, Michael Ellis, um, in the recent uh, Storm Eustace response, this was last Friday, uh, giving a brief or getting a briefing some, from some of our officials and the various sort of products that we can brief them with just to make sure that we're making the right decisions when we need to. And finally, of course, still joining on uh, the recovery aspect. So if something's gone wrong, what we're doing about effectively the cleanup. We've got big Boris here getting the mop out. Uh, it's not all about cleaning up physically, and uh, there's some uh, metaphorical in there as well. Uh, but we provide things like financial aid through the Treasury uh, to areas that have been hardest hit, particularly a pattern around now when we've had big storms and properties have been flooded, making sure that money is available for local areas to be able to get back to a level of normality. There's a recovery team within CCS that helps coordinate that, much like when you coordinate a response. This time we just record the recovery. So if you'd like to come and work for us, uh, there's many opportunities, there's many ways of getting into CCS, many ways of getting into the civil service. It is a bit of a mind group though. Um, so you need to be sort of wary of the various things you can do. It's very, very rare for a direct recruitment process to come into CCS uh, and that went into government, of course. Um, so there's these various schemes you can go through here. Uh, I became a business condi and badly. Um, and uh, and there's many other uh, stories around the room that you can speak to on the phone. Um, be wary, our processes are complex. The systems are illogical, it seems. Uh, there's plenty of stuff online to help you 
get through what's called success profiles. Effectively, you need to provide an answer against a certain criteria, and we score you against that. Uh, and it all seems very logical. There's lots online, just drawing attention to these. Please look up our own success profiles. If you're applying for any job in government, this will be what you have to match yourself against. Um, but there's loads online, loads of resources that will help you through the process. And finally, just some brief recommendations there to follow. Um, what you're doing as a master's programme is a great start. I did a master's at Durham. It got me a leg up into the, into the actual sector. Um, what I would say is it will mean you will usually start the same position as everyone else, but your background and your academic rigour will help you accelerate through the, <coughs> you know, accelerate up the grades quicker than those who maybe have not. Um, it is often not treated as a year of experience. It should be, uh, but that is changing. Um, so what you're doing is a very good step in the process. But you can also join organisations such as the Red Cross or International Rescue and Salvation Army, etc. They're all really key responders these days and will look really good on your CV and give you a background and how most response happens. So there are lots of other opportunities that are both vocational uh, and full-time that you can do uh, if you want to choose to get into this area. And that's all for me. I'll be there with these guys in the stall. Thanks very much for listening. I'll take some questions at the end. Take, hope some questions at the end, certainly at the exhibitor store. We're managing will be um, available there. So, our next speaker is Nikki Hiranga from the um, International Organization for Migration or IOM. Okay. So, yeah, Nikki is lead editor. Editor of the IOM Displacement Displace Tracking Matrix. And before joining the Global uh, Displ Displacement Tracking or DTM team, um, she was coordinator of the DTM in Ethiopia, um, leading the countrywide data collection, working with the UN NGOs and INGOs. Um, I'll hand over to Nikki to explain more about what exactly the DTM is and the career opportunities around. Thank you very much. Well, it's fantastic to be here with you all today in person for once, which is a really great uh, change. So to start off, uh, just a little bit about IOM in general, and then I'll situate the displacement tracking matrix within IOM as one of the key emergency response tools. Okay, so IOM at a glance. So some of you may or may not be familiar with the International Organization for Migration. That is currently now the UN Migration Agency. It's an intergovernmental organization, which means that we're made up of member states. As you can see up there, we have 174 at the last count, and we also have a global footprint. So we're active in across a lot of different contexts in situations of emergency, but also in non-emergency contexts. So what exactly does IOM do? There's a big scope of work that goes on at IOM, all the way from migration management to more sort of development work uh, to crisis response. But today I'll mostly be talking to you about our crisis response area and also the work that we do in internal displacement. But predominantly, all of this work that IOM does is geared towards promoting the safe, orderly and humane migration people and supporting also uh, our member states and our implementing partners and our co-working partners um, in that objective. So if we're talking about crises, IOM has been around since 1951. Um, it's responded to a very wide range of crises across a large number of countries. You can see some of the big ones up there. We've also been involved in all of our uh, operations on the ground in COVID responses in a range of different countries. Um, the type of contexts in which we work in crisis settings include active conflict, protracted conflict <coughs> settings, uh, complex emergencies in which you have also conflict, natural disaster, and other political influences affecting populations, um, and as well purely natural disaster settings. But more and more, we're also responding to slow onset uh, disasters as a result of climate change. 
So this is probably what you're most interested in understanding. What are the different roles within um, an emergency response and what are the different roles within IOM? Where can you fit in? So you may or may not be familiar with this diagram. Uh, it's a diagram of the different sectors within a response. Um, each of these represents what we call a cluster. And basically what that means is each area targets a specific type of response. So you can see up there, you have health, you have logistics, you have nutrition, camp coordination and camp management, all the bells and whistles of the response. And each of these sectors usually harnesses the skills of a very specific set of technical experts. But there's lots of cross-cutting expertise as well that supports the work of these technical experts. And those cross-cutting skills include things like grants management, financial management, um, like accounting, uh, things like project management, drafting. You'd be surprised to find out that's actually a key skill. So we have reporting. We also have donor uh, donor reporting. Um, so being able to write well is is hugely beneficial. Uh, and data, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So data actually underpins all of these areas of the response, um, and this is where GTM comes in. So. The unit that I work in is called the Displacement Tracking Matrix. It's IOM's principal primary data collection tool. So it collects information on human mobility at the simplest level. Um, and its primary purpose is to inform operational responses. But since it's been active, uh, the first operation was active in 2003, 2004 in Iraq in response to the conflict there. Uh, since that time, it's evolved also as a tool that's more and more relied upon by policy actors and academics uh, to build a knowledge base around human mobility in situations of disaster and crisis, but also uh, cross-border mobility as a result of multiple and complex drivers. So what do we mean by IOM's principal primary data collection tool? Well, in order for all of those different sectors to coordinate their responses and to respond in a targeted way and in an effective way, you need to know who's affected. You also need to know where those people are, how many people are there, and also what their basic demographic profile is if you want to target them with all of those different sectors in a very useful way. We also need to know when they move, when they might move, um, and the characteristics of their mobility. So in settings like Ethiopia, you have very dynamic mobility <laughs> contexts where you might have thousands of people moving within the span of a couple of weeks. Um, and having that mobility profile can help actors on the ground understand where they might need to target their assistance or pre-set uh, their assistance and what they can expect um, as the situation evolves. You also need to know what those people need. Uh, so we collect information across all those different sectors in terms of the needs and vulnerabilities of the populations that are affected, as well as the characteristics of the conditions that they're living in. Where do we collect data? So this information is uh, recent as of 2020. Our uh, global survey is ongoing to update this information. But as you can see, we have uh, a global footprint um, active since the start in over 100 countries, but uh, since 2020 active in 78 countries. Uh, and at last count, targeting 31 million internally displaced people. So actually, maybe something of interest here is that we're quite decentralized. So these blue dots that you see, some of them represent multiple offices, but they represent different teams of DTM uh, operations, DTM, data collectors active in those countries. <clears throat> so how does it work in practice? Well, you have the program set up. Say there's a, a trigger, a sudden onset emergency. You have either the deployment of experts from that country office who are already based there uh, into the locations where the disaster has occurred. Or when you have a completely new disaster, you have the deployment of colleagues from the global team, which I'm a part of, into that uh, setting to recruit uh, people with the relevant profiles and to set up the operations. Uh, so that's the mobilization of human resources and also resources. resources. Um, you have uh, coordination with government officials. That's a very key uh, part 
of the setup process um, as well. So following that, you have the actual physical data collection, which happens uh, in person. Um, although in COVID, we had to get a little bit creative with how to do this data collection uh, in a remote context, but predominantly in person, um, either with direct field access or indirect field access. Uh, and that data collection is conducted by enumerators in the field with tablets through uh, mobile data collection applications. Then what follows after that? We clean, we process the data, uh, we produce different types of analysis for our targeted audiences, we liaise with the different actors on the ground who are conducting the response in order to understand their data needs, in order to understand their analytic needs, and we also support them in their own targeted analysis for their response. We share this information widely. So DTM, as part of IOM, is like a common service to the United Nations, but also to all of the actors on the ground in any given context. In case you're interested, these are primary components of data collection. So we have mobility tracking, which predominantly targets uh, internally displaced populations. This would be an activity that's conducted in a very like static context where you have people who are staying in the same place for more or less uh, an extended period of time. We have flow monitoring, which monitors internal and cross-border flows. Uh, we have registration, which maybe you will have seen photos of this, like in uh, collaboration with the World Food Program to facilitate food distribution. It's a census-like activity that's conducted in camp settings that are very stable, um, and it's conducted in order to facilitate even more targeted responses. Uh, and finally, we have surveys, which is a bit of a catch-all, um, and it's to provide sort of qualitative and supplementary information to all the quantitative data that we collect across the other areas. So I'll talk to you a little bit about DTM data use, and then I'll jump in with the type of profiles that we have within our team. Uh, so in terms of the data use, I've already mentioned about 100 times in this last five minutes that it's an operational tool and so it's used to target responses. But in addition to that, we use this information in partnerships with our government uh, counterparts and with our member states to support both at the country level, but also at higher sort of intergovernmental levels, policy processes. The idea is for IOM to present this as a common knowledge base on human mobility from which we can have data-driven policy and practice. So as I mentioned at the start, there's also growing interest from uh, academics and from students such as yourself in using this data, which is publicly available actually on our, uh, on our global platforms uh, for research and research projects. So we work at the moment together with Warwick University, with LSE as well, as with Yale University on various different research projects. So as a sidebar, if you're interested in using any of this for your uh, work in your program, please feel free to reach out to us for further information on it. So speaking of the types of profiles that we hire, we're a data uh, program. So we hire a lot of data scientists. But in addition to that, we hire people who are good with critical analysis. So people from humanities backgrounds, such as history, political sciences, programs such as your own, who are able to translate that very technical data aspect into something that's digestible and understandable for the data users, who are not always as data savvy as the data scientists. So there's key liaison roles there that actually we recruit from a wide range of different backgrounds. There's also coordination roles, which there's many, many different avenues into uh, entering into a coordination role within the DTM. Um, most of those involve some field of experience um, and some kind of also basic analytic understanding and understanding of data. Um, so in a more practical sense, how do you get into the DTM? How do you get into IOM? So IOM has a very well established internship program. All of the internships are posted both on the LEAF web and also on the IOM recruitment pages. And that's probably the most common way to enter into IOM. It's a very structured process of application and the organization has a very high retention rate. So we were counting the other day and actually I think 
more than 50% of the global team, including myself, started as interns. Um, so it's possible to apply for internships directly through country offices. It's possible to apply for inter internships with our Geneva offices and with the London office as well. Um, yeah. So that's it for me for now. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end and you can come and speak to us at the stall also. Thank you. You can ask questions at the end or at the stall later. So now I'm going to hand over to our friends uh, from AIR Worldwide from their various section. So we have. <laughs> Um, yeah, Natalie Vanek and Emma Lewington. So Natalie has worked in the catastrophe risk modelling sector since 2011, following her MSc in geophysical hazards, also at TCM. And she's now a manager within the client and consultant team on extreme event solutions at Veris. And I'll briefly introduce Emma now as well, who holds an MSc in polar and alpine change and a PhD in glaciology both from the University of Sheffield and following a short period as a university researcher and postdoc, she joined the research team uh, as part of that same team in June last year. Okay, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks everyone and uh, thanks for having us today. Um, so yes, we're, we're here to uh, talk to you um, about extreme event solutions, um, which is a various business. So we're formerly known as AAR Worldwide, but we've recently been going through a rebranding exercise. So if you do Google us, you can look up AAR Worldwide, um, but and that'll take you straight through to the various website. So various uh, extreme event solutions provides risk modeling solutions that helps businesses, individuals, um, and society generally become more resilient to extreme events. So in 1987, Verisk actually founded the cat modeling, sorry, cat being catastrophe, uh, cat modeling industry, um, and today models the risk from natural catastrophes, terrorism, pandemics, um, casualty catastrophes, and also cyber incidents. Um, so if you want to know more about catastrophe modeling, I recommend you, you Google, Google an introduction to catastrophe modeling. There's so much free, in, free information online um, from all sorts of sectors. Um, and it's particularly useful if, if you do look to go for any interviews when you're going into uh, catastrophe modeling. In essence, a catastrophe modeling takes a set of input data. So that's location information of, if, if we talk about property, for instance, we're looking at the location information of that property, how much is that property worth? Um, where, so where is it in relation to any particular hazards? If you think about how close is it to the coast, the storm surge, that kind of thing. Um, what's it built of? Is it made of wood? Is it in a hurricane prone area? How tall is it? Um, that kind of thing. And what sort of occupancy is it? So once you get that, that input, those inputs, then you feed that into the catastrophe models. Um, that then runs that through, pulls out the hazards, so things like the distance to the coast, um, looks at the vulnerability. So if it's wood, it's going to be a lot more vulnerable to a hurricane, for instance, compared to if it's made of concrete. Then you input also your financial terms. So because we're in the insurance industry, you're looking at what deductibles are there, what limits, and then that can output the probabilistic loss to that particular um, property if we're looking at that, or you can do it for a collection of property, a portfolio of properties. So you can then get what is your probabilistic loss for that portfolio. You can also then use, there's a lot of um, RGIS as well, so you can have a look at where the majority of your exposure sits, are all your eggs in one basket in Florida, for instance, um, or are you quite nicely diverse and spread across um, a wider geographical area? But what I really wanted to mention was the importance of catastrophe modeling um, and how far it's come actually since the debut in 1987. So when catastrophe models were first built back in 1987, very few people actually took much notice. Um, and it was only really when uh, Hurricane Andrew came through in 1992, um, there were unprecedented losses within the ins insurance industry. So people really started to take notice because in the, in the catastrophe models, there were scenarios where an, an event like um, Hurricane Andrew could occur. So people started to take notice for, uh, little by little. Then you had in 1994, there were the Northridge earthquakes and you can keep going through the decades. You've sort of had the 2001 Twin Tower attacks, you've had Hurricane Sandy, 
the Christchurch earthquakes, um, the Japanese um, tsunami in 2011 and the earthquake, everyone knew that you could have tsunamis in Japan, but no one really took into account how far inland that, that would go and sort of the kind of um, devastation that that would actually cause. Um, and it just keeps going, we keep learning. I think this is science as a whole, we keep learning more things we didn't know, we didn't know. And so, and that's, so it's a really exciting time in, in catastrophe modeling really, as we learn new things, able to build what we learn about these catastrophe models um, and just keep improving them um, as we go. Um, so, um, catastrophe models are used widely within the insurance and reinsurance industry, so that's where we sit within the insurance reinsurance industry, but it's also used in government sectors, environmental agencies and also NGOs, and I think more and more people are starting to, to find that the value of uh, catastrophe modelling quite quite useful. So within the insurance and reinsurance industry, there's actually several types of companies that you could work for. Um, there's insurers or Lloyd syndicates who actually underwrite the risk. Um, there's also brokers who act as the middle company between the people who are buying the um, insurance and the people who are selling the insurance. Um, and then you've got those who build and sell catastrophe models. So you can, you can be a catastrophe modeler or build the models within any one of those sectors within the insurance and reinsurance industry. Um, so where various extreme event solutions fits in, we are those who build the models and sell that out to the market. And then we actually help to help clients use those models to the best of their ability. So uh, we've got multiple teams within our um, various extreme event <laughs> solution um, department. So I sit within the client and consulting team. So I'm one of the team who will help a client in learn how to use the models. Then I can reach out to our tech department and how to install it in their environment. I can also reach out to our research department to help us understand more about the how, how things have been built. Um, and also then general client product, uh, general client projects who might have a look at how best they can um, buy their reinsurance or, or manage their risk um, best. Um, so my background, I've been in the market, uh, as Rosie said, for about 10 years. I actually, I did my UCL Masters here, Masters in Geophysical Hazards. Um, I then went into reinsurance, so as a catastrophe modeler, just in the reinsurance sector. So I was just helping, um, helping the underwriters understand their portfolio risk for, for the reinsurance side of things. Um, after about two years, then I decided that I'd, I'd learned as much as I could from a, from a syndicate. Um, and I moved on to a broker and from there I was helping, I was that, that middle person and that was, there was a lot of um, different types of projects where we were using the catastrophe models, we were helping clients um, with our, again, our model development team, they were building up models and we were helping um, them figure out um, what claims they, they had at the time, so helping with post-event um, response um, and all of that kind of stuff. So then I, from there I went back into a syndicate area um, it was a startup business at the time and just building out um, processes from scratch so lots of big data analytics using SQL, Excel, and really helping trying to automate their um, interactions with the underwriters and also with um, uh, the catastrophe models. Um, and from there, so I've been at various all of six months, um, I'm working with clients and consulting team, um, as I mentioned, helping clients learn more about the models and understand them. Um, and one of the reasons that really I really decided to move across to Veris is um, standing within my within the industry, our the, our teams that had a really great reputation um, within the markets. Everyone's very friendly, um, great work life balance, which I think is has always been important, but I think is being recognised more and more as being very important. The work's really interesting. It's diverse. You never know what you're going to be doing day to day, um, and you have to really enjoy working with clients, at least in the team, clients and consulting team that I work in. And that's something that was really challenging some days, but really rewarding at the end of the day. So I'm now going to hand you over to Emma to sort of give a background, a bit of background about her. Great, thank you. Um, so I joined Verisk um, last summer um, as a research associate in the London research team. Um, previously to that, I was in academia. Um, so I started um, in physical geography, um, and then I did a master's and a PhD in glaciology. <laughs> Uh, I really enjoyed studying and that's kind of why I just continued straight through and was in a really lucky position to be able to do so. Um, and despite enjoying my PhD, 
Um, it was summer of 2020, unfortunate timing, but I decided to take the plunge and look for something outside of academia. Um, and that's when I came across cat modeling. Um, so what I found really useful, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do when I finished, um, but I sat down, I wrote a list of all the things that I had enjoyed from my um, academic experience. Um, so I wanted to work in a team. I really enjoyed working with people. I think especially um, studying during, during the pandemic was obviously really hard. Um, there's a lot of isolation, so I knew I wanted to work um, in a team. I wanted variety um, in terms of the tasks I was doing every day and um, in terms of the topics I was looking at. Um, I think doing a PhD, you get very kind of catapulted into a single topic, and I really wanted kind of the breadth. Um, I wanted a job where I could stay up to date with the current science, um, continue and do my own research, uh, have the opportunity to do, um, as yet to do my own research, to present this at conferences, um, and things like that. And I wanted to carry on with some data analytics and coding skills that I'd started to develop. Um, so I wanted to be able to kind of continue with that. Um, as well as kind of presenting um, and communica communicating complex ideas. So I did quite a bit of outreach um, and teaching during my PhD. Um, and I, I liked that sort of aspect of it. So I wanted a role where I could continue to do that sort of thing. Um, and that's when I kind of came across um, natural catastrophe modeling. Um, so as Matt said, I'm in the research team. Uh, we work on a range of natural catastrophe models, such as hurricanes, floods, um, wildfire, earthquake, um, and we also have a growing climate change and resilience team. So in the London office, um, we have a research team. Um, we aren't directly involved with the kind of model development. Um, that's down to our parallel specific teams in our Boston office. Um, and that's actually where Veris is headquartered, so huge team over in the US. Um, but day to day, uh, my focus is mostly on the kind of the science and the hazard side of the natural catastrophe models. Um, so I spend my time keeping up to date with the current science on these topics, um, presenting and answering questions on our models, um, interacting with other members of my team and our clients, um, and in the quiet times, carrying on with my own projects. Um, so I've only been um, with Veris uh, similarly since last June, um, but so far it's been a, a great place to work. Um, it's great to be working within such uh, a great team um, and with people with different backgrounds and different expertise. Um, if you'd like to find out more, we currently have a range of roles um, in the CCSG and the research teams um, and within cyber and some of our other, our other teams. So please do come and have a chat or you can find um, the roles on the website. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's really important when you're, when you're applying for these types of roles. Some of the things that we're really looking for, I guess, because we're such a client focused um, team, we're looking for people who are really interested in interacting with clients you want that sort of challenge in dealing with different different things day to day. Um, analytics is a large part of um, what we do, and it sounds like a lot of presenters that that's a big part of what we all do. Um, so that sort of interest in, in analytics um, and driving changes is really important, as well as an interest in, in natural catastrophes or cyber or pandemics or casualty or the above. So thank you so much for having us today. Really appreciate it. And do come and ask us any questions at the store or equally at the end. Um, a quick question. I think AIR Wide are the only exhibitor that has come to every single one of our career fairs since we started. And they have recruited directly, I think, people from our programme from this fair. I'm not sure who exactly is still working for them now, but certainly there are people from our master's programmes working. Yeah, who have gone on to work with them. So yeah, they can tell you more at their stores. So do, do speak to them and find out more. They may well have opportunities for the new products. So. Yeah. so um, our next speaker will be Caroline Dastara from the British Red Cross. And yeah, they've also presented a few times at this event for us. So Caroline is a disaster risk reduction and early action advisor uh, the International Director of, of the British Red Cross. Um, so her background is a BA in International Relations and an MA and MSc in European Studies from Münster and Twente Universities. Um, she was based in Asia working for NGOs and the UNGP and she was joining the London office of the British Red Cross in 2016. She can tell you more about that and what she did for the British Red Cross. Thank you, Rosie. 
Uh, can you all hear me okay at the back? Yeah, okay. We're not gonna bother with the microphone. Uh, so good to meet you all. Um, and uh, as you heard, you know, the Red Cross always come from teams. Some of my team just snuck out to set up our stall, but I have a whole bunch uh, with me today from different areas in the Red Cross for you able to speak to them as well. Um, and I also have Saji with me, who is actually with Human Resources in British Cross. So basically, he hires you, so you might want to make friends with him. <laughs> so um, <laughs> now I thought I'm going to go a little bit different today. Um, so what I thought is you might want to know, you know, what does a disaster reduction advisor actually do day to day? So I'm going to talk with you um, an example of what a day um, as me would be like. Um, and for that, I'm going to explain you a little bit about what the different roles uh, at the British Red Cross and the Red Cross uh, Red Peasants uh, movement is going to be like, um, and what kind of things we're looking for. <clears throat> First of all, congratulations. I think with your masters, you basically have your career already uh, worked out because as we know, disasters, crises are on the rise, especially with climate change. Um, somehow we always still seem to not be able to really um, get the better of them. So when I was a student, there wasn't a master's in disasters reduction and resilience yet. Um, so I think, you know, well done for you. Um, I definitely think there's going to be work cut out for you. When I was your age and doing an internship, um, actually someone told me at the time, go into disasters, they're always going to be disasters. Um, so congratulations, but also good luck, because as you can see as well, disaster risk reduction is getting more and more complex. And that's you know, why we were earlier saying about working in the team, super important, uh, because disaster risk reduction is always intersectoral. So me as an advisor, I always need to work with my colleagues in health, in Washington emergency response, in health, and so on, because it's always, um, you know, you can't solve the problem by yourself. Just a little bit about what is actually the British Red Cross. Maybe a show of hands, anyone heard about the Red Cross before? Yes, <laughs> maybe one, two. So I'm not going to go into details, just to explain that as a British Red Cross, we're um, not an NGO, we're not government, but we are like an independent organization. We are auxiliary to the government. So, you know, David uh, and others from um, contingency, they can call on us to help in crisis, like in the recent storms. Um, you know, Red Cross here, British Red Cross in the UK, goes out there, emergency response teams, knocking on people's doors who are vulnerable, who might need help, providing first aid and psychosocial support. So we work here in UK as the British Red Cross, but we are part of a bigger movement, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement. So around 192 uh, countries have national societies that are recognized by the government, by disaster management laws as national societies. Um, if you're coming from different countries, you might have a Red Cross or Red Crescent in your country as well. And we are all together in the Federation of the Red Cross. So there's the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent, which has secretariat in uh, Geneva, you know, kind of um, for the, doing a lot of the coordination. And we also have the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is also part of the movement, which especially works in um, conflict uh, situations. So what does a day look like as a disaster risk reduction advisor? Um, well, be prepared to be flexible and multitasker. Um, you never quite know what the next day is going to hold. So maybe, you know, you wake up in the morning and there's going to be an emergency task force meeting. Um, so maybe it's, you know, the crisis in the Ukraine or the typhoon in the Philippines or um, an earthquake somewhere or the crisis in Afghanistan. So we get on a call and we see what as a British Red Cross can we do to support the wider Red Cross movement and our partner national societies around the world. How do we do that? Very diverse. So we might be basically in three words. It's people, money, and... Um, <laughs> sorry, what's the third one? What was the third one? <laughs> um, basically, um, yeah, people, money, and technical expertise, I would suggest. But so we do... Oh, yeah, stocks. Stocks. That's the third one. Um, so people, we do have global emergency response teams, we have emergency response units. Um, so for example, Sergi has been having a really busy time the last few weeks deploying people all around the world from the British Red Cross to support other national societies in the crisis. Um, we might also support
support with you know funds and we have a big fundraising team um, one of the uh, colleagues alice here she is with the fundraising team um, or we might be sending also stocks and we have logistics teams around the world or support with uh, for just much more and one of the things that british red cross is quite leading in within the movement this cash-based assistance um, Maybe then after the emergency task force meeting, I might be trying to organize my next trip to Nigeria. Um, been there for six weeks in October, going again now for a couple of weeks in March. Um, where, because the Nigeria Red Cross is the partner of the British Red Cross, we have a long-term program on community risk reduction and resilience. Um, and so we were there uh, recently conducting um, and coaching basically the Nigeria Red Cross branch and how to conduct community risk assessments. And um, I was doing an early warning training, and so we're following up on that now, supporting the communities with their own action plans um, and trying to connect them better with the national med offices and the hydrogen operators so that they can receive better early warning. Um, not as easy said than done. Uh, so <laughs> these kind of things also take a lot of creativity, thinking how are you going to do an, um, you know, live an early warning training in a community where maybe. Um, there's no electricity and um, there's going to be a rainstorm. So you have to be on your feet and know what to do. Um, next up, I might be getting on the phone and call um, our colleagues in Iswatini, um, where we're supporting a project on early action or what we call forecast based financing. So basically, the Red Cross has been one of the leading organizations to say, like, why do we always have to wait till there's been a disaster? And you know the big pictures of people suffering are in the media, and then people give money in emergency appeals. Why can't we give money beforehand um, if we already know there's something happening? Um, so we've been working with organizations uh, like UK Met Office, um, the Red Cross Climate Center, to get much better data and forecasts on what is going to come. We agree the funding, um, so when the trigger hits, we can actually transfer the money directly and take early action and don't have to wait for the disasters to come. So in Iswatini, for example, we're working with the Iswatini Red Cross to develop an early action protocol for drought. Um, and uh, so I might be on the phone with um, Anna, who is with the British Red Cross, but based in Namibia, and um, also the colleagues from the Iswatini Red Cross, and discuss you know, how we're going to develop the early action protocol. Um, Last but not least, has been already a busy day. Um, I might be also asked to support the International Federation of the Red Cross. So I was telling you, they often um, kind of are the coordination hub and they do a lot of also things like training and um, um, coordination. And so for example, I'm part of a working group that develops uh, learning courses and training on disaster risk reduction so right now. We're developing an e-learning course on the vulnerability risk capacity assessment and community resilience. Um, so I might be reviewing the latest training there. Um, one word of caution. <laughs> um, so before 2020, a lot of you know my work was traveling. I would travel probably, so I hope you like traveling. <laughs> I was traveling maybe um, every other month. Um, last two years that has changed quite a lot. So um, a lot of more things has had to happen virtually, um, but I think we have made a lot of it work um, online as well. Um, so I don't think I will be traveling as much anymore as before, um, especially for things like conferences or other things that you really can do online. But there are some things that are really hard still to do online. Um, so for example, when it really comes to like, um, you know, coaching or training or doing assessment on the ground. So for these kind of things, I think we will still be traveling a lot. But the whole idea is that we're much more kind of coaching and supporting our national society partners. So um, what does it look like at the British Red Cross and how, how can you get working with them? Um, thanks, David, for the plug about the volunteer. <laughs> um, so definitely, um, there are different paths into the British Red Cross. Um, Saji here, he printed out some recent like vacancies right now and examples of vacancies so they're always positions that you can apply to um, but it's also a really great advantage if you can um, actually volunteer with the british red cross 
And there are many different profiles from people who volunteer as, for example, emergency responders or community resilience responders, you know, like in the recent storm, to people who volunteer, I don't know, the technical skills or the fundraising. So for example, Alice here, she was a volunteer while she was a student and doing her master's, uh, doing some volunteering with fundraising, um, getting also access for her master's thesis to colleagues at the Red Cross to interview them for her master's thesis. And now she has a full-time job with fundraising at the Red Cross. So a lot of the profiles are that you can start off in where, with some positions like a team assistant or project officer, um, or um, also kind of start later on kind of cross um, from different sectors. So from my own side, um, I always thought, oh, you know, the Red Cross is like a big you know, family. If you hadn't been already a Red Crosser in like primary school, you're not going to get in. That is not true. Um, so I uh, had worked for the United Nations before um, and for NGOs like Plan International. And then I applied directly to the British Red Cross. Um, and now that I'm there, I see actually that we have people from all, all kinds of backgrounds and, and fields. Um, so it doesn't need to be that you have to have experience, but it's definitely seen as an advantage if you know what the Red Cross movement is about, if you are passionate about the work as a humanitarian, uh, supporting people in crisis wherever they might be. Um, and if you are also willing to work in teams, are flexible, um, and really kind of have these values of being dynamic, compassionate. So, basically our fundamental principles of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Um, and um, yeah, I think don't take um, my word for granted. You can talk to others in my team. So as I said, um, we have someone here who works with fundraising, who uh, before was a volunteer and now has a job with Red Cross. We have someone there from HR. Um, outside, I also have a colleague from um, the London Community Resilient Team. So he works with the UK Crisis Response Team here in the UK and uh, is managing a community resilience project here in London. Um, I have a colleague who is with the Emergency Response Team. So she is the one also supporting, like deploying people all over the world. Um, and then uh, I hope also a colleague from the Red Cross Family Center is going to come, which is a reference center for the Red Cross. And they are kind of the ones giving us the scientific advice for our early action programs. Um, so happy to answer any questions and look forward to speaking to you afterwards. Thank you. One of your team was one of our MSC graduates as well. Yes, I think actually two. So Susanna from the emergency team, I think she was like one of the first ones <laughs> back in a couple of years ago. And then uh, Phil, who is now working with the London Community Resilience Program, he just graduated 2019. Um, so you can ask him how he got into the Red Cross. Okay. Um, I'll just make um, a quick note that, that, that I know that there's nobody else booked into this room, but I kind of I got going a bit late and I've let each talk carry on as long as it does a little bit. But um, yeah, do carry on with your speed. We're not pushed to get out of this you room. Sure? I can squash it. A little bit. A little bit. Okay, uh, hello everyone. So my name is Dave Carter, uh, nice to be here. I'm spread quite thinly across lots of the maths and physical science departments, but I'm new to the IRDR from a careers perspective this year, uh, and I'm going to do a spine tingling, what's going to be 10, probably five minutes or so. Um, and what I'm going to cover is uh, to give you an idea of just how employable you guys are, because you really are, and I'm going to show you some career destinations of where some of your predecessors have ended up, give you a few ideas about how to uh, source options, uh, because there's lots of different ways of, of going about thinking about careers and sourcing uh, opportunities, and I will shamelessly plug uh, for everything I'm worth, all that we can do for UCL careers uh, in terms of supporting you. Massively uninspiring slide to look at, but hopefully some quite inspiring information on there. To, to, to cut a long story short, um, 15 months after you graduate, there will be a call 
or an email that lands in your inbox, effect effectively trying to find out what you are doing, who you are doing it with, how much you are earning. Um, and what happens is all that kind of moves into university league tables, but it also means we have lots of data about where students end up. Now, the course is quite small and we have to go back to kind of 2018, 2019 because of the kind of 15 month out um, element. But from those two cohorts, uh, pretty much everyone was in a graduate level job um, and in some very, very well known organisations. So on the left hand side, there is just a few ideas of where graduates from that cohort ended up. And on the right hand side, I picked out some of the, uh, the larger multinational organisations and perhaps some of the more well known uh, destinations. This is quite interesting because uh, on the top left, uh, this is actually when students came in, they were surveyed about the sectors that they were hoping or would like to go into. And this is actually the same cohort where they ended up. Um, so you can see at the top, charities, non-governmental organisations, international development, policy and government. And what actually happened, accountancy and financial services, IT technology, et cetera, et cetera. So it may well have even been you come along to a, an evening like this, have your eyes opened, lots of exposure to interesting areas that perhaps you'd never considered before. It could be you're an international student and actually needed to be realistic about who might sponsor you in the UK. That might be perhaps multinational organizations who work more in the financial services area. Who knows? But um, the, the moral of the story really is that you guys have an incredible array of opportunities open to you. Around about 70% of graduate level jobs in the UK are open to anyone from any degree discipline. A huge array of competencies and skills you've got, you guys have gained. Um, and we're going to be producing something kind of quite detailed, but this just kind of gives you a snapshot of a real opportunity board um, because there are so many uh, varied routes that you could take depending upon what's important to you um, and the way you go about your job search. So this might be quite useful for you because you probably are in the middle of a very intensive course. You've got exams coming up, assessments coming up. Um, you can have access to UCL careers for three years. We find lots of your number in May in parallel with their dissertations, start thinking about life after UCL and start engaging with careers. Uh, because of the pandemic, so much of our work now is virtual. It's actually fantastic that we've got employers on campus because many employers now are very happy to talk to students, but they would much rather do that virtually which does play into your, your kind of hand in that you could be absolutely anywhere in the world and dialing into a virtual careers network or a masterclass talk on CVs or whatever else it might be. And so lots and lots of students do use us over the course of uh, the two or three year period after they've left UCO. All right, so how can we help? Um, we have a hugely um, popular job board. At the moment we have 3000 opportunities on there. Um, some of them are advertised nowhere else by organisations who are very, very keen to recruit UCL students. There are some catastrophe and risk-based roles on there now. And come the summer, that number will populate much more uh, fervently. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, the kind of slice of what we call graduate schemes and graduate jobs. Um, many of you in this room may be kind of very, very keen to work for a big multinational employer, be it the British Red Cross, the civil service, a big kind of financial house. But actually, they make up quite a small percentage of the overall number of opportunities, and they run what we call graduate schemes. And again, just to give you a quick idea, if you weren't aware about this, for those graduate programs, many of them recruit in quite a strict cycle. So many of them will begin in September or October. Some of them maybe have a March or January start, but start date, but they do recruit and open for applications extremely early, especially some of the kind of financial houses, insurance, reinsurance, banking. They may well open in July, recruiting up to 15 months in advance. The applications window can often be during the autumn and early spring, and that's where we have an awful lot of traffic through careers. Um, so you will notice that our careers fair program, so 40 organizations virtually in an area 
focused on management consulting or banking or whatever else it might be, look at the dates. Virtually all those fairs are within a three week period and that is to coincide with the big recruitment push through lots of, of multinational grad scheme employers. If, for example, you were interested in applying for those kind of uh, employers and you wanted to know how to put a CV together or an application form or get on top of interviews, we run daily masterclasses. They're called Career Essentials. I'm doing an hour session on interviews next week, packed with lots of video examples of what good and poor looks like. That might be something really worth plugging into. The, uh, the world of the pandemic has also um, allowed us to bolster our online portfolio of resources. So there is a whole industry out there now trying to capitalize on you guys trying to get good jobs. So we now have an AI uh, CV checking tool that you could buy personally, but we have licenses for that. I run a business providing interview-based courses to lots of universities. <laughs> Again, all of that is free through UCL careers. We have those licenses on your behalf. Some of you might come up against numerical, verbal reasoning tests, situational judgment tests. Again, lots of industries out there very happy to take 50 pounds worth of your money to give you access to practice tests. Don't pay, we pay on your behalf. That is all available to you through UCL careers. Um, that's my course. Again, lots of uh, practice uh, material and you can see lots of example videos of what good and poor looks like. Um, I'm just gonna skip that for the moment. Uh, I'll also skip that. Um, all right, what are the things you may be surprised about? Perhaps not for some of the organizations here, but a huge percentage of opportunities, especially in terms of work experience, which I know some of you perhaps have found it very difficult to get recently, um, that is never publicly advertised, is actually hidden. And in many cases, it's those who are really proactive that begin to make their own luck for themselves. So here is just an example, loosely based on a student I met last year, um, that really shows the proactivity that may be required to shorten your job search, especially if you're finding it difficult in a very competitive landscape um, to, to kind of go through the front door of many organizations. You will be amazed at, for example, the UCL alumni LinkedIn network. There are thousands and thousands of ex-UCLers on LinkedIn, all very, very searchable. People love talking about themselves and what they do, okay? Wouldn't it be amazing if you were interested in insurance or reinsurance or international development, if you had a number of ex-UCLers who work in some of these organizations that potentially could mentor you? That is not far-fetched. It's amazing if you reach out, and we can help you do this, reach out to ex-UCLers asking for maybe half an hour of their time to ask them lots of questions about what they do, how they got in. It's amazing how those relationships can develop. And I've seen work experience, even jobs mature out of those types of relationships. If all you do is just crawl all over Relief Web and those advertised job websites, don't be surprised if potentially your job search extends. Um, and even better, we have something called Bentham Connect. So this is UCL's version internally of LinkedIn. And there are hundreds and hundreds of ex-UCLers who put their hand up already to say, look, this is what I am doing. You can see my profile. I am willing to help you professionally in any way I can. We can help you navigate how to outreach to these guys, how to conduct an information interview, make the most of those potential relationships. All right, last slide. Um, I'll be outside, obviously, um, but if you wanted to speak to someone like me um, and have some careers coaching, no matter where you are in your careers thinking, we will be advertising some IRDR-specific appointments with me over the coming weeks shortly, but you could get help with your CV tomorrow, or you could talk to someone about your career plans tomorrow. If you have an interview coming up, you could even have a one hour practice interview coaching session with someone like me um, or book a bill in advance. Okay, so there's lots and lots of ways to engage with UCL careers. 
Okay, thank you very much. Remember, we're here for three years um, and do register for perhaps some of the, uh, the ways that we can kind of begin to drop messages into your inbox because I know you've got so many other things to consider about. Let us do all the work and come to you. Thank you very much. So I know um, we've laid on a bit, but I'm going to give you a bit of a chance to ask some questions. So the speakers want to come to the front for a quick question or two. Anyone from your audience have a question? You can also ask them individually at the um, desk talks as well. So any questions? Check with you on online questions. <laughs> service 